Today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some work that's been done over the past several years in my group, uh, primarily by a couple of different graduate students. Uh, one, Lee, who has now gone on um, to, to other things, to greater things, and uh, Valentin, who should be graduating shortly. And it's work basically on um, using learning primarily for appearance modeling uh, that enables robots to navigate robustly using vision effectively. So again, thanks for, thank you for having me here for the talk. Let's, let's hopefully, hopefully things are going to, well, the first technical glitch might be the, ah, okay, excellent. So the lead actor in this, uh, in this story is uh, now Dr. Lee Clements. Uh, supporting cast is uh, Valentin Perchukin, who is a PhD candidate, and hopefully he should be he should be also graduating very soon. And then myself as the as the third person, basically, basically the accountant who does the books for this. So that's my role. All right. So uh, of course, I don't think I I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here with respect to vision. Why why would we use vision for robots in particular? Right. Well, cameras are everywhere. Cheap cheap cameras are cameras are now ubiquitous. Right, we have them. Uh, we have the more expensive cameras on Mars that are not quite so cheap. Uh, we have cameras on drones, and uh, you're, you're, if you have a Tesla, you have several cameras in your Tesla, and or uh, probably many of the other cars you've purchased recently have uh, cameras on board. So uh, let's let's certainly make use of them. Vision, fantastic, fantastic for sensing. Wonderful sensing modality. Right, rich. Uh, dense information about the environment, right? We have two eyeballs and a, a large section of our brain devoted for, to visual processing for a reason. It's because it works really, really well uh, in most conditions. However, uh, there are some problems right, with vision-based systems that's, that still exist. And one of them is that uh, many of the classical methods for estimating, say, robot motion using vision uh, make some assumptions about the nature of the environment and how the environment is going to change over time. And so we, uh, in, our, in our robotics group, typically deal with two, two types of uh, somewhat nasty changes for, for vision systems that assume that things stay the same. And that is short time scale uh, changes in lighting and weather. And these are some photos that were taken up at Utias uh, from Professor Barfoot's group of uh, uh, various scenes under different uh, lighting conditions in the, during the same day on the, on the top plot and then uh, over uh, an entire uh, cycle of uh, weather in Canada. So uh, if this was California, we'd probably have an easier time. It is, this is Canada, so we have stuff like that uh, nasty snowy condition where things change dramatically, right, dramatically over the season. So I'm primarily going to focus on the, uh, dealing with the first issue, lighting and weather changes on short time scales. But we've also started looking at things like seasonal variations and what you can pick out from seasonal variations. So what is the problem? Well, really the problem is if you look at some of the preliminary work on, on rover, rover visual navigation, for example, right, we, we typically envision make some, some, some useful simplifying assumptions that can make the problem much easier to solve, in fact, solvable uh, in a unique way, but that do not hold in the real world. So one is called brightness constancy or photometric consistency. So if you're familiar with it, it's simply the idea that uh, at least over short time scales, the, the uh, intensity of light and the, the color of light effectively coming off of a surface doesn't change with small changes in motion or um, um, time, right? So, so we depend on that often. Uh, and we also depend on consistent feature descriptors. So if we're doing feature-based motion estimation, picking visual features out of images, we typically assume that those also are uh, findable again uh, and that something hasn't changed dramatically from one time step to the next that prevents that. However, appearance change due to things like angle of the sun outdoors uh, or uh, the passing, uh, passing of a cloud, for example, these can create pretty dramatic changes in your images from being saturated to, to non-saturated, for example. And in practice, if we're going to run really robust navigation algorithms, we, we're just we're led down a road that needs to deal with these problems uh, eventually. So we, we've tried to tackle it in a couple of different ways. And I'll talk about three of them today. I'll spend probably a little bit of time on the first couple and then go into more detail on the second. So the first thing we can do is try to negate appearance change by doing something smart uh, with the images themselves. And I'll talk a little bit about something we've done that uh, in that area. Um, the second thing we can do is try and remember appearance changes. So if we're running a robotic system, um, it's not necessarily a one-shot deal. 
right, for nav, we may be able to perform multiple loops over multiple time scales and just remember every time that we, we navigate a particular route. And this is something called uh, spatiotemporal um, navigation, I would say, or spatiotemporal uh, experience graph uh, uh, generation, where you lay down uh, a new uh, uh, trail of experiences that layer up in time. And so maybe every half an hour you drive the same route and you record all of these things. And some of these ideas have been developed both at Oxford and uh, within our own group by Professor Bar, well, our own uh, institute by Professor Barfoot as well. The idea of spatiotemporal experience graphs or spatiotemporal pose graphs. And the other, the final thing we can do is uh, try to get quite a bit more sophisticated and actually say we're not going to rely on photometric consistency. We're actually going to try and uh, do something like learning to, to be smart, to understand how the environment is changing, and then essentially produce a predictive model or some type of model that can um, guesstimate how the world might change and then compensate for it such that um, some of our older techniques for uh, vision-based navigation still work. And so we're very much in this category, basically in the learning category, and a little bit in the negation category. All right, so modeling appearance change, I won't spend too much time on this, but appearance depends on a number of different things, right? So the image you ultimately get out of your camera depends on, of course, what you're looking at. It depends on the camera you're using, and it depends on how you're moving through the world. So one important question we come up with immediately is can we, can we use more information uh, that is available in camera images to pick out, to extract more than just geometry? And so the first thing we did when we were looking at trying to improve robot motion estimation was extracting more than just geometry from imagery. And so I'll tell you about something to do with the sun that we, we, now, we now do to extract extra data from images uh, that can help us navigate and reduce drift effectively. Uh, and then the next one is really a learning-based approach that, I'll, that I'll, I'll focus on actually in the bulk of the talk. And that is producing generative models uh, of appearance that can be used with standard metric localization techniques. So the approach that uh, Lee and Valentin have taken to these problems, Lee in particular, uh, was not necessarily to throw out, I wouldn't say baby with the bathwater, but um, not necessarily to throw out the older techniques because they work really, really well in many, many cases. So when I say, when I say older, I mean like, you know, things from, say, 20 years ago. Very, very robust visual navigation techniques that just don't deal well with appearance change. Those are still very valuable techniques. So we didn't want to get rid of them entirely. Uh, so instead, we fuse those with some generative modeling basically up front, try and do something smart, mitigate appearance change, and then feed that into a standard robot navigation pipeline for, for vision. And then there is a third question, um, and that is to what extent can we actually use some of these appearance models for for persistent lo localization and what we would call long-term autonomy. And that's something I actually won't, I think that dims, yeah, I'm not going to, I won't talk too much about number three. I'll start with number one. Number three is a harder problem. When we say uh, long-term autonomy, we're really talking about autonomy on the scale. When, I, when I'm saying long-term, I mean autonomy on the scale of years, you know, months and months to years. So then having to deal with nasty seasonal changes like Toronto getting, uh, or Nova Scotia getting a meter of snow, that makes appearance modeling really hard. If you can drive at all, if you can, if you can drive your rover at all, right? Maybe you fly, maybe you fly overhead, but still, everything is white. That's a, that's a very difficult, uh, that's a very difficult problem. We certainly haven't solved that yet. So, all right. So the first one, uh, the first project I'll talk about that was done a couple of years ago, um, was to try and leverage some additional information and images to help our, help our rover navigation pipeline. And uh, so what we did, um, after trying several things with non-learning-based techniques that did not use uh, deep convolutional neural networks, uh, was to build a deep convolutional neural network that we, we dubbed SunBCNN that is effectively a technique uh, to, to find out where the sun is um, in your images uh, as your rover is driving from, from image data. So the question is, why, why would you want to do this? Why would you want to look at the sun uh, or, or find out, not directly look at the sun, but even just know where the sun is in the sky uh, as you're driving around with a robot? Uh, and the problem is actually the following. It's that if you, if, you do, if you use standard what's called visual odometry, for those of you who may not be familiar, visual odometry <clears throat> is just a frame-to-frame, -frame, essentially dead reckoning approach based on vision. So you're tracking some features, 
you incrementally estimate your pose change from frame to frame. Uh, you, you add all those up, and that tells you your overall path through the world. That works pretty well, but you can imagine that it is a dead reckoning technique. That means that you don't have a map. You have no prior knowledge, necessarily, of where you're driving. Uh, and so you accumulate drift um, uh, unavoidably, right? There's always noise. You always slightly misestimate your translation. You misestimate your rotation just slightly. And it turns out the nasty thing is orientation error. So if you get your orientation incrementally slightly wrong, over time this will build up and you will diverge to a super linear uh, growth in your overall path tracking error. So if you want to drive in a straight line, you might think you're driving in a straight line. What in fact happens is your orientation diverges and you start driving sideways and you just don't know it. So how can you fix this? Well, there's a couple of different ways. Uh, and one is to have a landmark, to have a reference landmark that, that gives you a constant bearing. Right? And if it's something far enough away, if it's very, very far away, then you can effectively treat it simply as a directional cue, right? almost like a compass, almost like a compass needle. Um, so the CN Tower, you know, from a, from a distance would be a reasonable landmark. We want something even farther away, effectively almost infinitely far away, which, which is the sun. Uh, and the sun provides, if you know where it is, the sun provides an excellent directional landmark. If you're aware of the time of day and where the sun should be in the sky. <clears throat> so in this work, we assume that we have a computer on board the rover that has a synchronized clock and we have ephemeris information. So we know when the sun is rising and falling and uh, we can predict uh, where the sun should be in the sky. Uh, maybe we know where we start, but we don't know how we drive. So we're driving and we're trying to figure out, perhaps using the sun, um, how to correct this orientation drift. So if you can correct the orientation drift, if you can look at this constant bearing landmark, you can actually use that to reduce the, orient or the overall uh, error with driving to linear, basically linear in the distance traveled. Uh, you can do actually very, very well if you can correct this nasty orientation error. And the sun can help with that. So there's a few different ways to do it. Uh, one is to use a specialized hardware sun sensor, and some prior work has in fact done that. Uh, the sun sensors are very low power, uh, which is nice, and basically they just give you uh, uh, the centroid of the sun if, if the sensor can see the sun. But that's kind of the problem, is that the sensor doesn't always see the sun, and these sensors also actually tend to be very, very expensive. They're built for satellite systems, not for for terrestrial navigation. So that's one way. We thought about trying a different approach. Uh, and that was instead to try and look at cues that are available in existing images, in existing stereo pairs uh, that are coming into a, uh, a Bayesian convolutional neural network. So I won't talk too much about the, the Bayesian CNN itself, uh, except to say that we developed a system that effectively lets you feed in RGB images and actually spits out a 3D sun vector, azimuth and elevation, um, where the sun should be in the sky. And if you can guesstimate that with reasonable accuracy, you can then fuse that into a standard visual odometry pipeline as an orientation measurement, effectively, and you can mitigate uh, much of that orientation drift, if not all. So this is just showing actually that we, so we did train a, a network that does this, that looks for or cues that tell you where the sun might be in the sky. And it turns out this is actually a pretty hard problem even for people. Um, obviously, uh, during bright, bright sunny days, you can just turn and look at the, the sun and you know where it is in the sky. Um, if your camera is fixed, say, on the front of a car, um, you may not be able to pan or tilt the camera to look directly um, up in the sky and try and find out where the sun is. And diffuse cloud cover also tends to make it hard to figure out exactly where the sun is, but you can usually, you know, you can guess reasonably well. Uh, it turns out convolutional, known, convolutional, convolutional, ooh, it's hard to say, convolutional neural nets can do very similar things. And so what we have here is just some slices. We've taken slices through the network and we're looking at network layer activations and the network, you know, brighter means higher activation. And so the network tends to pick up many cues, uh, we think, uh, that are very similar to actual cues that have been um, noted as being useful in prior work that did not use a learning approach to try and, and simply find the sun, actually. So things you would think of, shadows, shadows on the ground, directional shadows provide great information about where the sun must be to cast that shadow. Um, bright sky, right? bright lit sky, that is a good cue. Uh, 
bright sides of certain buildings versus dark sides of other buildings. All these things are cues that can help you determine uh, where the sun is, actually. And so we published, we published a bunch of this work. U of T was nice enough to, uh, to give us a, a shout out tweet about, <laughs> about the sun estimation work. So you can read about it. And actually, the code is available on GitHub if you, if you want to try it out. It's, uh, um, uh, it's all there. Basically, you can download the model. You can play with it. Um, and it works. It works pretty well. I think I have a video here showing. So um, what we typically do is compare on the Kitty data set, right, which uh, um, produced by, uh, in part by Raquel Erdison down the hall. Um, so we tried this on Kitty, and what we're just showing here is a video that's uh, the true orientation of the sun, because we know exactly where we are driving with the Kitty data set in Karlsruhe, Germany, uh, versus our estimated uh, sun vector, which is in green. And you can see that it's, it's pretty good. Um, but there are some places where it, where it jumps. And so what we're showing you here uh, are several different ways of actually working with this sun information. So without sun, this is the trajectory and this is the error you get. And as we go progressively farther to the right, you do a little bit better, of course. And then sun BCNN does a bit better than uh, a similar competing technique that works in 2D with a slightly different model. And then these two other uh, cases are from prior work where we looked at uh, essentially using handcrafted probabilistic models. So uh, Jean-Claude uh, uh, um, Lalonde um, developed some, uh, some probabilistic models for, for determining where the sun is uh, that were not based on learning, effectively, and uh, they don't perform uh, as well as this learning-based approach. So in general, you, you can do quite well. Now, um, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be honest if I was saying it worked under all conditions. So uh, it, there are certain cases, of course, where you have to be careful with thresholding that sun vector, because as you noticed, uh, we are doing it on a, a single image pair basis, and so it can, it can jump around um, a bit, a single image or a single image pair. So that vector will, will, will jump, and uh, you want to be careful. Also, there are cases, I don't know if I have one here, um, where there are ambiguities. Um, so shadows are sometimes cast by leaves and light filtering through trees, uh, things like that. And that can actually cause, uh, that can cause um, false detections of the sun as well. So you have to have some gating function on that. We do produce with Sun BCNN an estimate of the uncertainty associated with our sun vector. Uh, that's one very important part, so it can be fused into another pipeline. But in addition to that, you also do have to be careful for, for these gross outliers that do occur uh, now and again. So we also tried this. We tried this with some other data, actually driving uh, with a different data set from, from Utias, actually. And we found out that uh, this was a data set produced by Professor Barfoot's group uh, in the Canadian High Arctic. And we found that, in fact, you can do almost as well if you look at this plot or this trajectory, which is uh, it's, uh, several hundred meters. We found that you can do almost as well as having a hardware sun sensor uh, in the high Arctic where there were no clouds, basically. So the sun sensor uh, on that vehicle could actually see the sun at all times. Um, our cameras are really just looking at imagery that is from the ground with the camera pointed forward. So this actually does work. Uh, it can be nearly as accurate as a hardware sun sensor, and it does work in a variety of conditions. Um, the other, the other take-home message, and, and originally I was a, um, Maybe I'm still a bit of a deep learning, maybe I'm an end-to-end -end learning skeptic still, maybe, maybe, a little bit. Uh, but I used to be a, a, just a, a CNN skeptic. Um, and uh, then uh, you know, Lee and uh, Valentin walked into my office and said, uh, here are some results. And uh, it's, it, it's very hard. We, we, we spent a lot of time trying to work with the handcrafted, hand-engineered models of the sun. And then we realized that deep networks just you know, definitely, definitely outperform. Um, even without which much, that much training, they definitely outperform. So, okay, so that's one thing. So basically, that was a, an earlier project that helped us improve our uh, visual dead reckoning. So now, if we have information about the sun and a simple clock on board our rover, um, even if we have no map, we can drive more accurately, linear or hopefully sublinear in some cases error growth in terms of the distance traveled. Good. Uh, so then Lee actually decided to move on to tackling uh, a little bit more of the problem of appearance change. And that was to come up with these, uh, these concepts related to generative models of appearance that could then also be fused into a standard, standard metric localization pipeline. So rather than trying to learn everything end to end, 
Um, we took the approach of starting with a pre-processing step effectively on the images and then feeding that to a, a more traditional um, geometric model for either SLAM, for localization, for mapping, what have you. So starting with this generative model and then feeding that into SLAM. And so the first thing uh, that we worked on was something called CatNet, um, which uh, CAT is short for Canonical Appearance Transform. And so the, the best pun we've had on a paper to date has been uh, the title, How to Train a Cat, colon, uh, uh, something about appearance modeling. Um, <laughs> some people liked the pun, some people did not. Um, nonetheless, uh, CatNet by itself just simply stands for Canonical Appearance Transform Network. So one of the inspirations, or one of the areas that Lee looked at for inspiration for this, uh, after trying a bunch, again, of hand-coded stuff uh, in my office, um, was to look at some work on image-to-image uh, -image translation. Um, and so we, we basically came up with a direct, uh, a direct uh, photometric technique for, for direct localization in this case. So a localization problem under very dramatic lighting changes. And, and we did this as a pre-processing step where we would feed in an image, um, a tracking image, and then try to come up with something called a canonical appearance image. And then perform our direct localization using this canonical appearance image. So this is the idea that I think I have it on a future slide, um, is that you would try to address the problem of photometric inconsistency. Um, and I won't go through too much of the detail about the error terms. You would try to introduce this or, or mitigate this problem of what we would call photometric inconsistency, the fact that lighting is changing on the fly. And so you have to do something about it. Um, by uh, by doing something by doing something smarter. So this is just saying that this this whole slide is just saying that we can account for this by by adding some pre-processing step, and this pre-processing step is going to try and map whatever view of the world we're seeing now onto a view of the world we have seen under different lighting conditions, and we choose that privileged set of lighting conditions, which are usually diffuse lighting. And we try to map onto that. And then once we've performed that mapping, then we actually go ahead and use uh, the, the standard direct photometric loss in a, in a visual navigation system to estimate pose change. So there's lots of different choices for this, for this mapping. The question is, how do, you actually, how do you actually choose this mapping? Sometimes there are simple things you can do, like affine transformations, simple analytical transformations that can actually get you partway towards uh, illumination robustness. We thought we would go a little bit farther and actually uh, put this through a neural network. So basically what we're doing, as I said, this, in ca this case is an affine transform, but what we're actually doing is something more sophisticated with a neural net, where you end up with an output image that's going to hopefully look like a reference image. So you can do this with affine transformations, you can do this with gradients. It just doesn't work well for really dramatic appearance changes. So this is a situation where you have a flashlight illuminating a scene, and uh, those are the output results. Right? So you, you can't actually undo a flashlight type effect with a simple affine transformation or a gradient transformation. It just doesn't work all that well. So uh, since there are limits to simple analytical transformations, the next obvious approach is to try, based on our work with, uh, with SunCNN, is to try and learn this. So why don't we instead, as I said, try to map onto some previously seen canonical appearance. And then we can compare, once we perform this mapping, take an image, do the mapping, get an output image that hopefully looks like a reference image we have seen before, just from a different perspective, but under, the, under very, very similar lighting conditions. So we're mapping across lighting conditions using this image to image translation process. So here was the idea, right? We've already seen that Sun, B, C, and N can outperform hand-engineered uh, features for visual illumination estimation. So why don't we try and learn this transform from data as well? And so that's what we did. Uh, there's a growing body of work on image-to-image -image translation, right? It continues to grow, grow very dramatically, and there have been some great successes. So uh, this is where Lee started with his work, was to, to apply some of these image-to-image -image translation techniques, do this. And ultimately, we came up with a, uh, an encoder-decoder network architecture, basically a UNET skip connections that are involved as well to keep some high, high frequency and, uh, information around between layers. 
Uh, the details of the actual network are, are not too important, although the network is also available uh, on our GitHub uh, repo as open, uh, open source software, so if you want to use it, you can use it. So essentially we feed in some input image which has some appearance change, and we have trained across a very wide variety of appearance changes. We hope a sufficient number of appearance changes, such that in, in specific environments we are able to undo lighting effects effectively. And then once we've undone the effects of lighting, we map back onto some what we call a canonical appearance. We can then use that for direct photometric uh, localization, basically the standard photometric loss where we assume that that photometric consistency idea does in fact hold. So in the right, in the right column, we are in fact assuming the photometric consistency holds, but in order to get it to hold, we have to do something first to undo the lighting effects. So we tried this with a couple of synthetic data sets first. Um, so one caveat of the approach is that in order to do this um, reliably, you need to know how each pixel changes under lighting conditions. And so that means that you need near identically posed camera positions for training. So what you would ideally like is to be able to drive through a scene many, many times or many different scenes many, many times with a camera uh, put in ex almost exactly the same position. So you can get these near pixel wise transformations. That's very difficult in practice. So we started out by training on two data sets that are simulation data sets, one of which Vir Virtual Kitty, which is designed to emulate the type of environment found in the Kitty data set, in fact, actually. So we did that. Um, and this is just a result. So uh, on the ETH, uh, ETH sequence, which is an ETH uh, Zurich data set, right, we, have, uh, we have a top row here that's showing you the synthetic imagery that's been uh, generated of an office space. The static transform here is what we'll call our canonical appearance. And uh, in our case, we, we get to choose in this work what that canonical appearance should be. But later I will tell you that actually, in fact, it's not clear what the best canonical appearance is. So we've made a choice that diffuse ambient lighting is probably one of the best things to map to. Um, it's not clear though, maybe there's something else. And so in later work, we've explored a bit of that. Anyway, you can see the results here. So if you look at the bottom, so the top is actually how the images are changing as they come in and the trained network outputs are on the bottom. So as I, as I show you this, right, what you should see, hopefully, that the row of images on the bottom look almost all like this left-hand image. They look, they map almost onto the static illumination condition, almost. And you'll notice that the far right image of the flashlight is pretty challenging. Uh, the network does hallucinate some artifacts because really there you have such a narrow cone of illumination that uh, at the boundary there, there's, not, there's really not much to work with there. Nonetheless, it actually does pretty well and it turns out that in fact that, that does improve your, your photometric uh, direct localization performance. So this is just an idea of how you can do in the synthetic world um, so it's just measuring uh, translational and uh, rotational errors as a function of distance with and without this uh, canonical appearance transform. So if you just did something naively and tried to do direct photometric mapping, uh, these are the types of errors you would get over the, the percentage of the distance traveled. Right? And the green bars, you want to see green bars that are small, uh, that are low. And so by, by applying this transform, you actually get a win, you get a major win, uh, even in the flashlight situation. So we dramatically reduce the amount of error in localization, of course, in the, in the flashlight scenario. Um, so this is great. So this is actually, this was very encouraging, very good. So we did exactly the same thing with the kitty, the virtual kitty data sets. And again, we chose overcast sky as our canonical appearance. Again, because that seemed to represent a good, uh, you know, a good illumination situation, diffuse ambient illumination, and then some of the other images you see have strong shadow cues and other things that are effectively largely removed once the network uh, has, has pre-processed the images. This is sped up by a factor of two for driving. So, so that's good also as well. So this was encouraging. And again, I'll just, I won't go over the, 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 the uh, uh, details of this in too much, uh, uh, too much uh, uh, intricacy, but uh, Virtual Kitty again is still, uh, is also a win for, for this canonical appearance transform-based approach.
So we did publish this work, uh, and then this is, uh, I should just point out that we had some, we got some, uh, some tweet, a little bit of tweet feedback from Mike Milford from uh, QUT saying, not sure whether to applaud or groan, but then he came up with the, uh, he came up with Rat Slam and, and Cat Slam, so he couldn't complain too much about our how to train a cat uh, approach. I think he, I think he kind of liked it. So uh, anyway, that was great. So we published this, but um, as you noted, we, we did try to transfer this to, to the real world, of course, uh, but it has limitations. And, uh, and to, so of course, being transparent about those limitations, right? There are three important limitations of the work. One is that uh, it, it potentially requires very nearly, not, not, not necessarily identically posed, but very nearly identically posed pairs of training images for supervised learning. And that is, that's just simply not practical. Or for, if you want to do this outdoors with a real robot, um, using Pro Professor Barfoot's uh, visual teacher repeat framework, for example, you can come very close to driving exactly where you drove before, but rocks are going to jiggle you in different ways. The camera is never going to be positioned such that it's pixel to pixel uh, accuracy that you have for pose. So that's, that's a difficulty. So it limits you largely to training in simulation. Now sim to real is getting better and better and better. So that may be okay, but it is still, it is still an issue. The other thing is we're not sure. Uh, we didn't allow the learning system to choose what the, what the arbitrary or what the canonical appearance should be. So in fact, that was an arbitrary, arbitrary choice made by us. Uh, as people thinking, well, you know, probably diffuse illumination is the way to go as, as the, the best canonical appearance to map to. Do we actually know that in practice? We do not. We have no empirical evidence other than it happens to seem to work well for people. Uh, but uh, a learning-based system could potentially learn this as well. And so uh, that is one other thing. Finally, the last thing was that we were doing this um, without regard to the underlying localization pipeline that was actually being used. So this was a pre-processing step that we decided on, implemented, built, and stuck in front of um, direct localization method X or Y or Z. Uh, without any regard to what X or Y or Z might actually be doing in terms of photometric uh, localization, or, or you know, what other improvements might be possible by actually looking more deeply into what was happening in the actual localization pipeline. Now, it's nice to be sort of pipeline agnostic. Uh, on the other hand, perhaps you can leverage things about the, the pipeline that you're using in order to make the task easier. And so the solution uh, that was developed, uh, again, largely by Lee and, and, and a little bit by Val, was to actually change this up and reformulate the whole thing as a self-supervised learning problem, pardon me. So we realized, of course, that um, a robot, uh, at least over short distances, can, can estimate its own pose change. Um, and so we can actually take advantage of that information. Even if, if the lighting change is not you know, flickering a light on and off, uh, then over short time scales, we can actually use uh, existing information about pose change to train our networks in a self-supervised manner for a self-supervised learning problem. Uh, and so the idea is still to learn an invariant appearance of the environment. Uh, rather, uh, this is just rather than translating between two arbitrary appearance conditions. So we're gonna try and learn something now that's a bit different. So we were still trying to do something that we, we thought this canonical appearance might be the, the ideal invariant view, but um, that may not necessarily be true. So let's try and let's try and truly learn something that is invariant to um, essentially the the lighting conditions. If you if you have uh, if you if you if you know if you're thinking about it that way, uh, and so we decided to try a rather simple technique, um, something that we that uh, that we called that Lee came up with called maximally matchable uh, image. Uh, uh, maximally matchable images, so a transform that would make images maximally matchable. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, and so one of the typical ways to deal with unaligned image data in image-to-image -image translation is to use GANs to achieve self-supervised training. So we took, uh, we kind of ripped a page out of the GAN uh, section of uh, uh, the neural net textbook, but we didn't, it's not exactly a GAN that we implemented, but we did something very, very similar to a GAN. 
Uh, the issue with using GANs is that we, we actually can't, we don't know what this invariant image space is uh, right at the moment when we start, so we can't directly, we can't sample from that invariant image space. We have to do something else. And so, um, we decided to do the following as a last piece of, a last piece of work in Lee's PhD. And that was to try and take a look at what the actual localization or, or SLAM pipeline was doing and um, come up with a way to use that information in our, in our pre-processing stage to actually get images that would be more amenable to generating more features in this case for matching. So the one problem you immediately run into with a lot of the, the classical localization pipelines, things that use thing, um, procedures such as RANSAC or, um, or other outlier rejection techniques, uh, nearest neighbor matching, these kinds of things. Uh, in some cases, they are differentiable. In many cases, they are not. They, some of them are be becoming differentiable now in different ways. But in general, the classical pipelines, the, the localization pipelines that we use, you can't backprop through. So then the question was, well, if we can't backprop, how do we train a network to actually, actually do this, this pre-processing using something about the localization pipeline if we can't backprop through the localization pipeline? That seems, to be, that seems to be a conundrum, right? So uh, we instead did something a little bit different. We created this lovely little diagram uh, of a looping back. So we decided instead uh, to, to train a different network. Uh, in fact, a network that's actually split into two, two effectively separate pieces. And what we would do is we would create a proxy, a proxy network that would sit next to the localization pipeline that you were using. And the proxy, le proxy network would simply learn to predict what we hope is some measure of localization performance from what this non-differentiable localization pipeline is doing. And so, in fact, what this allows you to do is to create a system that is now learnable. So it's, it's, you can backprop through it. It's a proxy network. You can backprop through it. And yet it is, it is attempting to learn something about what the underlying localization platform is doing. So we're trying to take advantage of uh, the localization platform saying good things that happen are good. We should be training our networks to learn good things. We can't backprop through this thing, so we're going to backprop through this other thing that uses some measure of localization pro uh, performance from the underlying uh, localization pipeline. And so the thing we chose was, actually, and is cut off there, the, the easiest thing we chose to do was simply to learn uh, a network that could predict the number of inlying feature counts after the uh, true localization pipeline had gone through all its stages. So the loss function here for one portion of our network, the proxy network, is just a simple number. It's just a number. It's the number of matches that the uh, localization pipeline thinks are good and actually uses to produce its pose estimate. So the localization pipeline is running, it's computing matches, it is computing a transform, right? It is running a ransack, uh, outlier rejection procedure to get rid of outliers. And in the end, it comes up with not just a pose change, but it comes up with the number of features it used to actually predict that, that pose change. And typically, um, and not, not in all cases, but in many cases, more features means better performance. So a very sparse you know, set of few features means you probably will not localize as well. Now that is not guaranteed, but you probably will not localize as well. So one interesting thing to do is just to try this, this very simple metric. It's certainly by no means the only metric we could use. You could use something like actual pose change, but the nice thing about this is it's a very simple, it's a very simple number, which means we have a very simple loss function. Um, and it, it actually provides a reasonable measure of what we think is localization performance of the underlying pipeline. So we have this differentiable matcher proxy, and it turns out that if you look at this on, uh, this is just a training set, uh, mean squared error, and uh, test uh, validation set, mean squared error, in terms of predictions, prediction accuracy. So it turns out that um, a reasonably constructed proxy network um, can learn uh, quite well to predict the output of uh, what's called LibVizO2, which is LibVizO2 is a, um, it's a visual odometry system, effectively a, a, a quite good, well-known visual odometry system. And so we're using LibVizO2 as our uh, underlying uh, 
motion estimation system, and we're just trying to predict how well we expect the Vizo 2 to do on a set of input images, and just, just simply in terms of match counts. And so we can get predictions that are within about 10%, sometimes better, sometimes just slightly worse. And if you actually look at the correlations, so we've just plotted some correlations here between what you think you would get and what you actually get. Uh, I won't, again, spend too much time on this, but these are different data sets. And there are some, there are clusters effectively, and the, it's color coded such that uh, you want to see things on the diagonal line. The diagonal line is estimated versus actual. You want things to be clustered around that diagonal line. And if you are clustered around that diagonal line, you have a strong correlation, which implies that the network is actually learning something important about what LibVizo2 is doing without having to actually dig into LibVizo2. Uh, which again, you cannot backprop through, at least at present. Okay, so that was the first part. Uh, and then just to finish up, I'll just show you the second part as well. There's another trick here. So the first thing is to do some training on this, this one network that, it, um, that starts to learn how well LibVizo2 is doing on various images. Then the next part is to produce a generator network that is actually going to learn some type of transformation um, that will actually improve the match count performance, which is ultimately our goal. And so we don't want to just keep feeding in the same grayscale images into LibVizo2. Um, the network that tells us how well LibVizo2 will, will do is not useful unless it informs us about how we should transform the input images such that we can maximize how well LibVizo2 is doing. So we build one part first, and then we actually combine two parts together and train them um, train them in a, in a way such that they complement each other. So in this case, we didn't open the, uh, we didn't open the, uh, the a box of possibilities to all possible transforms. We actually used some, some information that we already had. We already knew that uh, there are physics-based models of what's called color constancy um, that depend on certain things like ideal black body illumination and some other things and infinitely thin uh, camera responses. Uh, nonetheless, these color constant image transforms are actually very good at mitigating things like shadows in images. Um, and uh, moving to what, what would be almost an invariant um, uh, brightness space in some sense. And they're simple. They're based on only a few. Uh, there's a logarithmic function that's involved here without uh, going into the physics of it. Uh, it's, it's really pretty straightforward. And so you can actually try and figure out the components of this, this RGB log function, the, the coefficients that should be stuck on the front. You can try and learn those to produce something that looks like the images on the right, going from color to grayscale. Most of the localization pipelines just operate on grayscale images. So we're doing an RGB to grayscale mapping using this, this pairwise encoder network, which takes in two images with different lighting conditions and attempts to spit out uh, alpha, beta, gamma. So uh, the first question then was, well, is this physics-based model, which uh, we know from prior work, um, both at Utias and elsewhere, can be very helpful for localization under appearance change. Is that linear combination of log responses based on physics the best thing we can do, the only thing we can do? And it turns out that we tried a couple of other things, and it's not necessarily the best thing you can do. You can do some other things. We can create smaller networks to do bespoke, what we would call uh, pairwise uh, pixel mapping. Again, model is a neural, neural network. So we can just make our network more complicated. Basically, have it learn more things. Uh, and so the overall network that we built uses uh, two different types of components in this side. But it's essentially, as I said, split into two pieces. And so I'll just walk you through very quickly, going from right to left, what these pieces are. So I probably don't want to block the camera, but on the lower right, you have this non-differentiable localization pipeline. So in our case, that's LibVizo2 for right now. Non-differentiable, it's doing feature matching, it's doing outlier rejection, it's doing the standard nonlinear optimization for visual odometry, typically. Opposed to, it could be other things, visual slam, but for now, visual odometry, right? And it's optimizing some SE3 pose. So rigid body transformation from frame to frame. That's the goal of the localization pipeline. That's all it does, there's no learning involved there. We are feeding into the, both the localization pipeline and our proxy network uh, the output pairs of images that are coming from this other network. Now, as I said, the one on the right is actually built first, 
and pre-trained a little bit first uh, to learn something about how libviso2 works before we open it up and train them both together. But this proxy network is just trying to replicate the number of match counts from the, from the uh, localization pipeline. So that's it, just that single number. How many matches is libviso2 spitting out um, versus how many matches is our, our network spitting out? Can we, can we minimize that error? And that's, what that, that's all that network is doing. Then we train these things in an intermittent fashion in a certain way, uh, such that on the front then we stick this learned image transformation network, which is taking in, again, pairs of images, uh, not identically posed in this case. They don't have to be identically posed. They can be uh, in similar places. They should generally be in similar places, but they don't have to be at the same camera position, which is the key. We're feeding that into an encoder CNN, which is doing some fancy things inside, and ultimately it's doing an RGB to grayscale transform, and it's spitting out grayscale images that it then thinks, and I'm uh, anthropomorphizing the network, <laughs> but the network then thinks are the best, um, the best images to give to libviso2 to actually improve localization performance. And it does this in a sequential fashion. So uh, as we're feeding in images, we're adjusting each image such that we hope it's going to have the maximal match count with the last image that came into the network. And so what you get out are pairs of images that are transformed in, in quite interesting ways. Um, the logarithm, the calculation does some really interesting things that can it can change, you know, things that are, are certain colors uh, or, or certain uh, intensities that were white, they can come out different colors. It's, it's very interesting. But the nice thing is that this is all, that transform is learned. And we didn't hand engineer that. So we didn't put that into the network. Um, the network was just allowed to learn that on its own. And so this got us away from the problem with the cat net that I told you about before, which was that we were simply selecting what we thought was the best. In this case, we actually can say something about the transform being valuable um, and potentially uh, more valuable because we've tied it now directly to the performance of our specific localization pipeline. On the other hand, we don't necessarily have generalizability now because we've trained all this, all this infrastructure around this classical libviso2 pipeline and certainly if you were to swap libviso2 out for something that operated in a different manner, um, you would have to retrain this network, right? It would not necessarily, maybe it would transfer, but you certainly, uh, you wouldn't want to try, I wouldn't suggest just um, tearing out libviso2, putting an orb slam or something else, and then uh, without any further testing, going out on the road and uh, trying to drive around. I would definitely check this. Check, check for valid images and outputs you know, that the, the learned network lo uh, loss is actually close to the true network loss. Anyway, so we tried this. Uh, we tried this in a bunch of, uh, on a bunch of different environments. We started again with simulation just because we, uh, we had used it before and it, did, it is nice. We have you know, very controlled conditions in simulation so we can see what's going on. And uh, it's, uh, I won't, it's again a little bit uh, difficult to go through all the options here. Some log is simply uh, a very general process where we only learn alpha, beta, gamma. So we're applying the same alpha, beta, gamma transform and log space to, to the images across all images. So we haven't tried to do anything image really specific. So that's, this, that's this row. Some log plus encoder is where we added this encoder network that is trying to actually then maximize use of uh, other information that's contained in the images to do even better. Uh, Multi-layer perceptron is a second technique that Lee came up with where he built uh, smaller bespoke networks that would operate pixel-wise uh, to try and do something uh, that would beat this sum log algorithm. So this is a little bit different. And then also here, adding this encoder stage plus this bespoke small multi-layer perceptron piece. Uh, and so for these, I'll, I'll leave these details for you to look at in the paper if you'd like. Uh, but the the, the telltale graph is, uh, or plot is on the right-hand side. And that is a plot, uh, it's, you know, it's a block, box and whisker plot, right, showing you how we're doing in terms of match counts. Match counts, uh, inlying, inlying feature matches that have been passed through libviso2 and actually used by libviso2 for localization. And those are, the, those are the kind of counts you get. So here, it turns out that the the physics-based, and in some sense, some log transform plus this encoder network 
actually happens to perform really quite well. It boosts the, the boost the count from the standard grayscale from about 200 features in the image to up around uh, 700 features that are used. That are, and these are, again, our inlying features that LibVizO2, through its own outlier filtering process, LibVizO2 has actually decided to use to compute the rigid body pose transform. So, so that is, is not guaranteed to be a metric of, of localization accuracy, but it is certainly encouraging. So then we took this outside, uh, thanks to, uh, uh, with much thanks to Professor Barfoot, who had already generated what is called the Utias in the Dark data set, uh, where they actually drove uh, our large uh, grizzly robot around and around at Utias um, once an hour um, under all uh, illumination conditions, including headlights actually including uh, driving at night with just headlights illuminating the scene, uh, following the same path approximately in a visual teach and repeat framework. Um, but you know, again, without pixel, without the need for these pixel to pixel perfect um, matches to train anything. So what you're seeing, just sorry, all the yellow lines are just feature matches um, between frames. So what you wanna see is, uh, you're, you hope to see lots of yellow lines when things are going well, when things are not going so well, Right, uh, like in the grayscale case, um, across large appearance changes, right, you get very few feature matches. And so this is a, this is kind of an extreme case where we've taken a, a mapped image during the day in this spatiotemporal pose graph. So we've selected one slice of the graph that was generated during day, daylight and one live image, which we would say is like what you would be doing right now, that was taken at night under headlights. So this is one of the most challenging cases that you can imagine coming up with, right? So I, I, I allow you to, to um, drive around in daylight, and then I come back and tell you, now you have to localize again, but uh, I'm only gonna give you headlights uh, with which to do that. And so the scene looks quite radically different. Um, and as you can imagine, compared to Virtual Kitty, uh, the results do not, uh, they're not as good. Nonetheless, it does turn out that um, compared to the grayscale case, the number of uh, match counts for, for inlying feature matches from LibVis02 using the sumlog E transform again uh, actually goes up quite substantially and, and wins. Uh, it's a little bit ahead of the multilayer perceptron and uh, with the encoder network, a little bit. The last thing to tell you about is the final graph on the right. Um, so the challenge we also have in, the, the, in this case is that we're running, we are running images through pipelines with, uh, with data that has already been collected. Right, so for the experiments we have done um, to date, although we may do some more uh, coming up fairly soon with actual in-the-loop control, for the experiments we have done to date, the image stream is already provided to us. So we can't speed up or slow down. Uh, we, can't, we can't deviate from the path that's already been set. So the best we can do is compare to the existing image stream that we have uh, in terms of performance. And so what we've done on the right-hand side this is essentially a mapping experience that's, um, the attempt here is to map from daylight across the localization at night. And so that's what we think is probably the most challenging case we could come up with. Right? And so the, what we do then is just determine the success rate. So the success rate here is um, a relocalization success rate. That's the percentage of the time you get at least 10 inlying feature matches from these pipeline from the pipeline um, using the transformed images versus the standard grayscale images. So with gray in this situation, frame to frame, only 35% of the time does LibVizO2 actually spit out um, a transform at all because LibVizO2 actually has a lower threshold setting that says if you don't have at least 10 inline features, I'm not going to give you anything because it's probably not going to mean anything. So LibVizO2 has this lower bound. Uh, so we said, let's, let's set our localization success rate at, at 10 inliers. And if we say we can get 10 or more inliers, it's a win. With the sumlog encoder transform, 98% of the time we get more than 10 inliers, which means that 98% of the time on this day to night sequence, collapsing this entire graph of hourly sequences into just day and night, we are actually able to, what we would, what we would hope uh, is to effectively localize, at least coarsely. Uh, so that success rate is, is, of course, much higher than with the standard grayscale images, um, or even the, the sum log transform with the physics space sum log transform. So that, that's great. That actually means that it's, it's leading us in the right direction. 
that is telling us that um, at least on a short time scale of like a day, we can take a large spatiotemporal experience graph, and I'll actually maybe I'll just stop on this for a second. We can take a large spatiotemporal experience graph right, with many layers that may have been generated hourly with different drives uh, once an hour in order to make sure that there is enough uh, of a bridging experience that you can continue to localize under all lighting conditions. This is pointing towards the use of a uh, image transform preprocessing step in a learned network framework that can actually compress that graph. So now, instead of potentially 12 layers, uh, maybe you have two. And right? so you've dramatically reduced the data requirements, you've dramatically reduced the search requirements. It is certainly not perfect, but it is a, it's a step towards uh, dramatically reducing the amount of data you need in these uh, spatiotemporal uh, experience graphs in order to perform reliable localization under widely varying lighting conditions. So we were, we were happy with this. We were like, this, we were excited. We were saying, fantastic. We can, you know, headlights are localizing with headlights given a given a daytime sequence is, is good. We're we're excited. This is great, wonderful. So I I was cheering Leon, uh, and then uh, we tried it on a harder problem. <laughs> <laughs> and the harder problem, uh, it, thanks again with, with him, I have, to, I have to preface all of this with a huge thanks to Professor Barfoot because without his uh, uh, very accurate and um, uh, expensive, time-consuming data collection that he has done with his group over the past several years, we would not have access to these wonderful data sets that can allow us to test some of these algorithms. So thanks to, to Professor Barfoot as well, we have what is called the Utias multi-season data set where they took the same rover that you saw, well, you, you saw the pictures from in the, last, uh, in the last sequence, same grizzly robot from ClearPath out, but they, they, we drove it around, well, they drove it around, uh, while we watched, over, over several like, seasonal changes. So going into, from summer into fall, across winter, and back into spring, effectively. So, uh, and in this case, what we've selected, this is three times, so the, the, the thing is actually not driving as fast as it shows here. We again are showing match counts, um, grayscale, but now you see that um, uh, the difficulty is that one, uh, one sequence, the map sequence, has snow and was taken under daylight conditions, and then the live sequence has less snow uh, because it melted. Um, under much darker near nighttime conditions, and so we thought, well, let's Let's try and train some things and throw, the, throw this at the problem. And it turns out that um, sum log E, the sum, the sum log uh, transform with the encoder network, still wins, but actually grayscale, just the regular grayscale transform doesn't do too badly. And there are some nice, there are some nice uh, better wins up here, but the median is not you know, so much. This is around 10. The median here is about 22, so it's not, it's not a huge win. Um, and so again, we did, the, we did a very similar test, similar to what I told you about with localization performance um, uh, before. This is just a slightly different plot, which I'll finish up with, that says effectively uh, the following. We, we've upped the inlier count, so we've made the problem a little bit harder. We've said, now we're going to require 20 inliers to count this as a success. So if we, if we have 20 inliers, we count as a success, that's more than 10, we're likely gonna get better localizations. So we've gone up to 20. And the numbers here, instead of percentages of successful localizations frame to frame, we decided to switch it up and perhaps provide a slightly more useful metric. The distances you see above each bar plot are the, uh, the distance you would have to drive on pure dead reckoning uh, on average, before you actually were able to relocalize to your mapping experience. So in this case, basically what you want to see is, you want to see a low number, which means I didn't have to drive effectively blind on VO until I happened to find another uh, matching image frame where I got enough inliers. Um, you want to see a low number, and so here, the average for the sum log plus encoder transform is 12.9 uh, meters. So that's good, that's better than just grayscale. Um, so again, encouraging, that's with 20 inliers. So you don't have to drive that far before you can localize again. The, the trajectory here is on the order of several hundred meters as well. Um, but you'll notice a couple of things. You'll notice that actually, in certain cases, the, the grayscale 
works better. So for example, grayscale works that works better than the physics-based transform, just what we call sum log, which is just that log operation. And actually grayscale beats our, our bespoke multi-layer perceptron, and it beats the bespoke multi, small multi-layer perceptron plus the encoder network. So the only win we get is with the sum log uh, plus encoder network, and even in that case, it's you know it's maybe by a factor of uh, it's by a factor of three in terms of distance on VO. Um, that's good, but it also just points to the fact that um, we it just confirmed what we already knew to be true in our minds, and that is that dealing with lighting change on short time scales where the state of the world itself does not change very much is actually quite, quite feasible, uh, especially with the, you know, the, the, the reasonably sized networks that we've used to date. Dealing with seasonal variation is, of course, much, much harder. So seasonal changes, snow, uh, grass growing, right, all these kinds of things, they're, they're just, if you're doing a feature-based approach, or even a direct photometric approach could potentially be worse, the world is really changing in a way that the network, it, it's a much, obviously a much, much, much more complicated modeling problem. And this network, while it helps, doesn't, doesn't fully solve the problem. So in this case, we're not, we are reducing the number of experiences potentially necessary to do this driving, but not nearly as much we did as we did in the previous case. And so for, for multi-season route following or navigation, localization, this is likely insufficient. Yeah, uh, it's a step we hope in the right direction, but it, there's certainly a lot of work people could do and are doing in this area on, on uh, localization under uh, major seasonal variations. Okay, so thank you, I'm, I'm a bit over time. So with that, I, I, this is my favorite picture of our, our lab. Some people, some, some, some of you, <laughs> there's a couple of people in the audience in this picture. Uh, this was us just at uh, the ICRA conference uh, in Montreal this past, this past year, the gang got together, so that was great. Montreal was close. Uh, so I'll say thanks very much. I'd love to take any questions that you have. I appreciate you allowing me to run a few minutes over. And if you are interested, much of the code is available. Uh, much of the code I talked about, SunBCNN, uh, the maximally matchable uh, transformation um, code, et cetera, is all available uh, publicly on our GitHub repo. So uh, please, by all means, go uh, clone it, check it out, branch it, um, beat it. And then, you know, uh, send us emails saying, Man, you guys missed this, we can do way better. That we'd love to, we would actually like to hear that information. So, all right, thanks very much. I appreciate it, guys.